experiences as executives, climate action is feasible, it is practi practical, it is financially smart. Last week we had the first of many meetings that we will have with labor leaders who we look forward to working with to develop climate solutions. And today we continue to build the case that climate action is doable and not the exclusive domain of progressives. But right now Democrats don't have a dance partner when it comes to climate action in the United States Senate. Our Republican colleagues have chosen not to be here. And the National Republican Party as a whole is the only major political party on the planet that doesn't have a plan for climate change, and many of them actually make fun of climate action. And I make this point not as a jab, but to point out that there is a space to be conservative and to do something about climate change. Historically, conservatives in the United States have wanted to preserve institutions, have wanted to preserve the status quo. They've wanted to move incrementally and to abide by the law of unintended consequences. And so under that definition, there is nothing conservative about standing by while the planet becomes less inhabitable for humans with more droughts, wildfires, and refugees. There is nothing conservative about allowing this level of disruption or this amount of ecosystem collapse, especially not when you look at the cost of this problem to the taxpayer. And I'm not alone here. When you look at the polling, and I know we will get into it, Republicans outside of Congress support climate action. A poll that came out earlier this year declared that we have reached a tipping point when it comes to climate action. It found that a strong majority of Americans are more concerned about climate change today than they were only a year ago. That majority includes 58% of Republican voters under 40, and the report noted that this particular demographic of Republicans are angry that their party doesn't seem to have a plan when it comes to climate change. And, to Senate, and among Senate Democrats, we couldn't agree more. That's why we're here today, because everyone in this room, Republican, Democrat, progressive, conservative, and everything in between can agree that climate change is a real crisis and we are experiencing it now, not in the distant future, not in the near future. It is happening now. The cost of action is much lower than the cost of inaction, and the benefits of action are just as great as the losses that will come from inaction. By that, I mean that climate action is not a punishment. It's an opportunity for us to reinvest in infrastructure, to pursue an energy revolution, to protect our farmers and the future for our children and to strengthen the middle class. But outside of this room, not everyone agrees with us. We have room for improvement when it comes to creating opportunities for bipartisan climate solutions. And so this committee is very interested in hearing our witnesses' insights into how we can better communicate with conservative stakeholders, whether it's young Republicans or religious communities. I'd like to welcome Dr. Frank Luntz, the founder and CEO of FIL Incorporated, Kira O'Brien, a student at Harvard University and the Vice President of Students for Carbon Dividends, and Nick Huey, the founder of the Climate Campaign. Thank you for taking the time to be here and sharing your testimony with us. We look forward to hearing your experiences and most importantly, your views on how we can make climate action a bipartisan effort. We'll begin by hearing testimony from each of the witnesses going down the line, starting with Dr. Luntz. Senator, I begin by thanking you for your leadership on this issue and acknowledging that I'm here under somewhat false pretenses. Your staff reached out to me because a poll conducted by Lunds Global, I realize it has the same name as mine, for the Climate Leadership Council in May of this year, it pronounced in bold headlines that the Republicans supported attacks on carbon as a way to fight climate change. The media, represented here, lapped it up from Time Magazine to the Atlantic, to the Financial Times, and even Bloomberg. The world was told that influential GOP pollster Frank Luntz, and I do appreciate that title, I will wear it with a badge of honor, at least on my CV, that I, that I call for a tax on carbon, and the GOP was warned that the electoral disaster would in, ensue if they didn't listen. And social media ate it up. Twitter forwarded it to everyone, and I got the best publicity I've had in years, I can assure you, Senator, that if you call for action on climate change, you become the most popular person on the pages of print 
and just about every television show. The only problem is it wasn't me. I didn't take that poll. I left that firm 18 months ago, but no one bothered to check the facts other than, coincidentally, the New York Times. Twitter was wrong, as it so often is. Social media was wrong. The mainstream media got it wrong. And so here I am sitting before you, grateful for the chance to correct the record. So what is, and here's the good news. What does America really believe? First, Americans believe climate change is real, and that number goes up every single month. They believe that it is man-made, and that number increases every month, and that both political and business leaders need to do more right now to address it. Second, climate change matters more to Democrats and less to Republicans. That is true. But younger Republicans do care about it a lot. It is a privilege to sit next to people who get this opportunity to address a senator at half my age. It makes me feel tremendously old. In fact, as a Republican speaking here right now, I understand how Dr. Kevorkian felt at an AARP convention. <laughs> Third, an increasing number of Americans are willing to pay or pay more, but only if that action has, and I quote, a meaningful, measurable impact on climate change. Support for a carbon tax is significant, but it melts away if it is shown to have little or no impact on climate change itself. And fourth, they expect the rest of the world to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, and that begins with China and India. Americans do not want to put this country at an economic disadvantage if China doesn't participate. So where does that leave us? As someone who polls and presents to both Republicans and Democratic leaders, climate change has become a partisan issue. And if we are to make a meaningful, measurable difference, we have to come up with meaningful, measurable, nonpartisan solutions. We also need to jettison much of the most extreme language in favor of a get-it-done approach. Senator, I agreed to be here because I see you as a genuine advocate for this. I see you as someone who's willing to put aside politics for good policy. And that's why I beg your colleagues to use some examples which I'll share with you after this introduction. For example, sustainability. Stop. Sustainability is about the status quo. Sustainability means that lake, that river, that beach will be there 20 years, 50 years from now. What the American people really want is something that is cleaner, safer, healthier. What they're asking for is improvement, not the status quo. Second is to focus on the consequences of inaction. The American people want to know the positive of this, not just the negative not just the fear, they want to know the benefit of focusing on it. And I end my opening remarks with my own personal interaction with climate change. I have a home in Los Angeles, and I was woken at 3.15 in the morning with my phone making the weirdest sound I've ever heard it make. It was an emergency, it was an evacuation call. I live in Los Angeles, and the so-called Skirball fire was heading down the 405. The courageous firefighters of LA, they saved my home but others aren't so lucky. Rising sea levels, melting ice caps, tornadoes and hurricanes more ferocious than ever. It is happening. I will tell you as someone who challenged climate change 19 years ago, which is when the media uses the language against me, that work was done in 2000, 2001 and 2002. That was a lifetime ago. I've changed and I will help you with messaging if you wish to have it, but in return, you have to put policies ahead of politics. You have to make the commitment not to make it partisan. We've had irreconcilable differences in the past, but we both have solutions and we both can get it done. Senator, I thank you for the honor of addressing you. Thank you. Ms. O'Brien. Chairman Schatz and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here to speak with you today about the challenge of climate instability and the path to bipartisan solutions. As neither a typical environmentalist nor a Democrat, I appreciate the efforts this committee has made to hear from unconventional climate voices. My name is Kira O'Brien, and I'm a senior at Harvard College. I'm the vice president of Students for Carbon Dividends and the former president of the Harvard Republican Club. I'd like to begin today by sharing with you why I care about this issue. I was born and raised in Ketchikan, Alaska, a small island community in the southeastern part of the state. I grew up in a culture grounded in reverence for nature, as well as in the knowledge that our natural resources are important to our way of life. Growing up in such a self-reliant rural community, it was almost inevitable I would grow up to be a Republican. It was also inevitable I would notice the disruption to our climate that is occurring. 
The thought of harm to or disruption of the Alaskan way of life makes this issue a priority for me. The wide-ranging economic threat of the challenge before us speaks to the bipartisan action that must be cultivated around the issue of climate instability. When I moved over 3,000 miles east of my hometown to attend college, I found my place with the Harvard Republican Club and the Institute of Politics. When I became president of the Republican Club, we were the first of many student groups to endorse the Carbon Dividends Plan, and six months later, Students for Carbon Dividends was launched. Since then, our founding coalition has more than tripled to over 100 Republican, Democratic, business, and environmental groups across the country. This was the first time a collection of college Republican organizations had ever publicly backed a concrete national climate solution. When I was first approached about supporting carbon dividends, climate policy, in my mind, was synonymous with regulation. After delving into the details, however, it became clear that this policy framework was not like any I had ever seen. Authored by two of the GOP's most distinguished elder statesmen, James A. Baker III and George P. Schultz, the carbon dividends proposal embodies the core principles of free markets and limited government. It would achieve significantly greater emissions reductions than all current and prior regulations combined and exceed the Paris climate target. The carbon dividends framework has been endorsed by every living former chair of the Federal Reserve, as well as by 27 Nobel Prize winning economists, the largest number to endorse any policy on any topic ever. It was also signed by 15 former chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, including every living Republican who has served in this role. And if that weren't enough, it was also signed by over 3,500 economists across the country, the largest such statement in the history of the profession. This consensus is overwhelming and has helped shift the conversation from asking what pro-growth, pro-economy climate action we should support to asking why our current representatives have not yet addressed this issue in a serious way. I have had countless conversations about my work on the climate, and the reactions have been resoundingly positive. From mentors, I have received words of support, often accompanied by the acknowledgement that their generation has failed us. My peers on both sides of the aisle are exhausted by the partisan bickering, the divisive entrenchment, and the staunch unwillingness to compromise. As Republicans, we have not yet managed to achieve a balance between acknowledging climate instability and resolving how to address it. However, as my fellow panelist Dr. Lentz has shown, Climate instability is an issue of great concern for young conservatives. Acting on climate is therefore not only good policy, it is good politics. Some have opposed modern climate plans because they worry they would undercut American capitalism. The plan we support does not harm free enterprise. Instead, it is revenue neutral, and it leverages the power of the market to achieve emissions reductions. Capitalism will be essential for attacking this challenge. This is an issue of great personal responsibility and concern for the inheritance of generations to come. The Republican Party has a long and proud legacy of leadership on environmental issues, from President Teddy Roosevelt and the National Parks, to President Richard Nixon's founding of the EPA, to President Ronald Reagan's leadership on protecting the ozone layer, to President George H.W. Bush's decisive action to curb acid rain. It is time for us to reclaim this legacy. As more Republicans come to the table to discuss meaningful solutions, so too must Democrats meet them with a willingness to work together to find compromise and be open to truly workable policies. Durable policy must have bipartisan backing. Concessions will have to be made on all sides. We cannot hope to create lasting change on a single party basis. I implore all members of Congress to place the best interests of the country over partisan politics when considering climate legislation. There are some issues so pivotal, they transcend partisan lines, state lines, and generations. Climate is one of them. I will close on a positive note. While I'm young, I am not naive when it comes to this issue. I am aware there are many sides to the climate issue and many challenges that will be faced. But I am hopeful for the future of bipartisan climate action. My generation has displayed a willingness to come together urgently to confront this challenge. We are now asking that our elected officials do the same. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you very much. Mr. Huey. Get that on? Okay. Uh, my name is Nick Huey. I'm a father of two, an advertiser, a Republican, and a Mormon Christian. I'm not your typical climate change activist either. The closest I've ever been to vegetarian is swapping a beef sandwich for a chicken one, and that was hard. It's not that I hate the planet. I just don't know why I'd bring a squirt gun to a forest fire. I'd rather call the fire department. That is why I'm here. We may be from different parties, but we're from the same planet. So thank you for your time, fellow Earthians. When I went to BYU, I had a baby. Then I had another baby. It's kind of a Mormon hobby. But with each new child I held in my arms, my concern for their future grew. I wanted to protect my children, and there was no way I could do that. It had to be a planetary effort. So I started trying to figure out how to bridge the gap between the far left and the far right so we could all work together on climate change. 
The answer I found was not a new policy. It was a new idea. I called it the far middle, a radical place where the left and right respect and learn from each other's viewpoints publicly. In 2017, I wanted to prove the far middle could exist. They call the rivalry between BYU and the Utes the holy war. Like the far left and far right, we hate each other. What if we could use our bitter rivalry to show Democrats and Republicans how to get along when it comes to climate? On the first week of fall classes, BYU students arrived at the U with over 3,000 purple flowers to place on, e on each of their car windshields. Why purple? Because the youth school color is red and ours is blue. Purple is right in the middle. With each flower, we left a video inviting youths to team up with us on climate, a simple, easy execution with unexpected results. The day of the event, the emails, began, emails from students began pouring in. We were broadcast on Utah's biggest news channels, garnering over 200,000 media impressions on our first day of operations. But we weren't done. One week later, 50 volunteers hiked the side of a mountain to shine a purple Y the size of a football field inside BYU Stadium during the nationally aired rivalry football game. At this point, sustainability coordinators from other universities began to reach out. We were featured in local talk shows and radio interviews. We got ultra-conservative Utah to start buzzing about climate change on every news channel. Why? Because we approached the problem from the far middle. The radical part of this campaign wasn't that we were angry and yelling. It was that we weren't. Climate change is not the sickness. <sighs> it's a symptom. Excuse me. It's a physical manifestation. <clears throat> It's a physical manifestation of America's deeper infirmity. Polarized partisan pride. I've heard both of my colleagues here talk about it. The problem isn't a lack of bipartisan options. It's a lack of bipartisanship itself. If we can strip away partisan pride and greed, the symptoms will go away faster than any of us could reasonably believe possible. The far middle is a place of humility, reason, and respect. It's the same kind of humility that inspires a group of Democratic senators to invite three young Republicans to come offer their perspective on the climate crisis. In the far middle, a liberal atheist <clears throat> and a conservative Mormon Christian can sit down and have a real conversation about climate, health care, guns and gays, and leave with new ideas. In the far middle, we treasure diversity of thought every bit as we treasure diversity of skin color even if those thoughts are in direct conflict with our own. I was asked to come here today to share the way forward, not right, not left, forward. The answer is to become radical far middleists, a collection of those who maintain one party affiliation while publicly embracing the other. Create a space where it's safe to concede, to work together, to respect, and you will resonate with your constituents and the rest of America on a level you didn't know possible. So, and I apologize, the uh, tears have made this last a little bit longer. Take, take your time. Okay. You're doing great. Thanks. So what can you do to create this far middle space when the far left and the far right dominate the headlines? The answer lies in big, safe, smart public gestures that in today's political climate are much more disruptive than another angry tweet. If there's one ad tip I can give you, it's when everyone zigs, you zag. Could you imagine the headlines today if instead of passing a resolution to condemn someone's rhetoric, you introduced a resolution to apologize for your own? It's a gesture of goodwill. Or if a Republican and Democrat went to rally in each other's respective districts because they saw in each other integrity and humanity. What would such simple, radical actions do to the dialogue in this country? If you want to move the needle, you need to be radically agreeable you need to be as radically agreeable as the far left and far right are radically disagreeable. I offer my services to, as an advertiser to anyone in this room free of charge, regardless of party, as long as you'll use them to heal the gap that has turned our climate into a political weapon. You each have unique opportunities to bring the far middle back into mainstream America. I would love to figure out what those are. If a handful of students from conservative Utah can get every single news channel with it, can get on every single news channel with a message about climate change, there's no reason a handful of senators from our nation's highest level of government can't do the same on a national scale. I imagine you all would like to see more of your Republican colleagues here. I would too. But for that to happen, someone has to publicly let go of pride in a big way. Someone has to soften. It's no longer enough to reach across the aisle in private conversations. Now is the time for radical collaboration to let love 
outweigh fear. The American public will not only permit such leadership, will break out the fireworks. The far middle has been muted by two warring parties, but we are still America's majority. Give us our voice back. Create the far middle, and climate change will take care of itself. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of the testifiers, uh, compelling each one of you in, in a different way. I really appreciate uh, your, your being willing to step out. Um, this is not easy for any of us, um, but this is a very important start. Um, Dr. Luntz, uh, you have words to lose and words to use. I'm familiar with it. I've seen it on TV. It works very well for me. Um, I guess the question I have is, first of all, I'm interested in specifically what you think are sort of danger zones to go into in terms of uh, particular phrases, words, attitudes to avoid. But I guess the other question I have after you get into that is the belief among some Democrats is that uh, whatever words we use will get put into a certain media, media eco ecosystem, and even if we have new ones, they will become toxic by the end of a 72 our cycle. And I wonder whether you want to disabuse me of that or agree uh, uh, with me on that. But first, let's, let's figure out what words to avoid. And then I'd like you to answer the second question, which is our view, and maybe it's not well earned, but it certainly feels that way from the Democratic side, is that we could come up with a whole new language, and by the end of the week, it would be toxic again. Well, first, if you can bring that uh, poster over and put it behind me, I'll do some of those. Michael, can you put up the uh, poster? Thank you. And, and I want to say to the three senators who are here, there's something wrong with our system when young people, to my colleagues, and I appreciate you saying that there are three young people here, but I'm older than the two of you combined. <laughs> so if this represents what's young, then we have a definitional problem here. There's something wrong in our politics when to talk about being a centrist actually brings out that kind of emotion. And that I say this to you because of the line that you used, which I've never heard before, and I promise you I will steal it from now on. Instead of condemning someone else's rhetoric, you should apologize for your own. Wow. Think of what's going on in the House side right now and how they have resolutions on this every two weeks condemning someone and no one stands up and says, hey, they got it wrong. I'm here before you to say that I was wrong in 2001. I don't want credit. I don't want blame. Just stop using something that I wrote 18 years ago because it's not accurate today. And we need to think of how we're going to talk to each other because this should not be happening in the United States of America, but it is. And this is what I get in my focus groups. This is what I hear in my one-on-one -on -one interviews. What you guys went through is happening every hour in our communication right now. So if you will look over there, do I get up and walk over to it? Is that? I think you should stay there for, so for our cameras, yeah. OK, I'll just do three of them up there. First is, it's not just about jobs. I'm going to ask the three senators up there, do you have a job or do you have a career? Senator? We all have careers. Then why are we talking about the jobs that are created from this? A job is something that you go to 9 to 5. Back, we're voting a, a career is something that you have 24-7. A job is something that you can't wait to get out of. A career is something that you embrace. Why are we not talking about careers when it comes to climate change? That's number one. Number two, a threat or a problem is negative. A consequence is something that personalizes this issue. I promise you, Senator, if you talk about the consequences of climate change, people will pay far more attention to you than if you, as we walked in here, referred to it as a crisis. And third, one world versus working together. We're all individuals. We all see life from our own perspectives, from Hawaii, originally from Connecticut. We could not be further apart. But when you're working together, it allows us to add our own experiences to something that's greater. The three of us don't see things exactly the same, but we are a team when we are working together. Invite people to join you rather than grabbing them and pulling them to you. Working together 
is the sum of the parts. It's greater than just one world. And I would make the same offer that Nick made, which is if we keep this nonpartisan, you can have everything. And I've looked at this issue now, and the language that I use today is different than the language from 18 years ago. And I wish that social media would recognize that. And I'll be happy to share it with you if, you, if that's something you wish. Thank you. Uh, Ms. O'Brien, if, uh, if you're walking up to a fellow conservative Republican and they have a view about climate change that is based on um, the sort of uniform that they think they're supposed to wear, and we all do this, right, in politics, uh, what's your best pitch for climate action as a conservative priority? Uh, well, I think for starters um, that it depends the age of the person that I'm speaking with. Let's say it's a fellow college student. A fellow college student. Well, then that's significantly easier, I will admit. Um, people of my generation generally, by and large, almost universally accept the science of climate change. Um, you will find little argument against it. So talking to fellow Republicans then becomes an issue of why are you not being more self-interested? This isn't a question of why don't you care about the animals, why don't you care about the ice, and I'm from Alaska. Uh, it's a question of why are you not being more self-interested and placing your, the interests of yourself, your peers. It's not about jobs, like Dr. Luntz was saying. It's, it's about where we are going as a country and how we're going to proceed. Because in 40 years, 60 years, we're going to be what's left. And I think most people my age realize that. Okay, now do your parents. <laughs> uh, already. Um, yeah, no, the, the pitch to parents is different as well um, because more people who already have careers are caring about the impact on the economy. Uh, so largely I would take the pitch away from the science um, because truly if you are placing a revenue neutral price on carbon, you don't have to believe in the science. I don't really care if you believe in the science. If you're willing to take the actions that will, it's an ends and a means kind of issue. If you're willing to place the price on carbon um, in a way that will not harm the economy, will spur innovation and unleash the free market solution, then you have already done the work. Um, so definitely speaking to somebody about how this is an alternative to a Green New Deal type economic restructuring, um, most people would be willing to get behind that. So in, in other words, what you're saying is that um, even if you didn't care about climate, a revenue neutral carbon fee would be good economically. Uh, with a dividend? Yes. 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 Senator Smith. There we go. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I'm learning a lot from listening to you. Um, Ms. O'Brien, I went to high school in Alaska, and I've been to Ketchikan, and so I'm pretty thrilled to see somebody from Alaska here today. Um, I have a lot of questions. This is so interesting, but let me start with this. A lot of times when I'm talking to people about climate change and solving the climate challenge that we have, um, and I'm I'm looking at you particularly because I'm interested in the young people's perspective on this. There's sort of this attitude that develops, which is, you know, I believe that this is the case, but this problem is so big and so huge, and um, what can I do to make a difference? I feel powerless by this whole conversation. I feel frustrated by the polarity in the conversation, and so I'm just going to back away from it. Um, this is not a place where I can make a meaningful difference. Uh, what have you learned? What can you tell me about how to address that, that challenge? And I'd actually be interested in what everybody thinks about this. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, a recent experience I had, a unexpected conservative member of the House uh, in a private meeting advocated for what he referred to as a global green plan. And I think that speaks to the fact that most people are in that position where they feel what can I personally do? It's, it's gone beyond recycling at this point. We need to recognize that even state action is not enough. We need to be tackling this from a federal level. Um, and the plan that we advocate for, um, the bipartisan carbon dividends framework, also has what's called a border carbon adjustment, which would encourage other nations to implement similar um, carbon pricing schemes in their own 
countries, mm -hmm. um, bringing this to the global scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would, it, would anybody else like to talk about that, that question of how you get beyond this sort of, it's, this is too big, I can't cope? Yeah, so, I mean, what I do for a living is I advertise for brands like Domino's and the American Heart Association. And the thing that's, um, when you feel most helpless when you're trying to get something big like that to move, is when there are so many voices in the room, you see yelling different things, and I'm trying to write a script that by the time it gets done, I feel like I've accomplished nothing. And I think that that, I, I really do believe that the root problem is that we feel like we can't do anything. We can't have a meaningful conversation, or we can't make meaningful actions on climate because there's not a meaningful conversation going on. And the reason that that's going on is because the far middle doesn't exist, right? Or whatever you want to call it. The, I, we, we've all talked about bipartisanship. Um, for us to make meaningful advances in that, we have to have a meaningful relationship with each other, even if we have different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. So I really believe that if we can get to that point and we can see progress being made together, people will jump on board. It's just there's no clear direction right now because everyone's yelling. Um, and if we can stop that and sit down and have a discussion, I really, really think I, I, I think that could that helps. Great steps. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Lanz? I'd like you to ask questions rather than answer them. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I have tried to varying degrees of failure to ask people, what is it about this issue that concerns you the most? Is it the weather? Is it the damage? Is it clean air, clean water? What matters most to you and what are you most afraid of? If you let the American people speak first, then no matter what you say afterward, you're gonna be connecting to them. It's very hard in politics because you're, you propose and we respond to you. If you turn it on its head and let your young people go first, they'll tell you what they need to hear from you and then you are much better off. But actually trying to get a member, I'll leave you guys out of it, trying to get a member of Congress <laughs> to do that, trying to get them to let their audience goes first is impossible. You know, Dr. Lunds, um, I'm probably the only member of the United States Senate who had a previous career as a focus group moderator. Wow. <laughs> so this is something that we have in common that we did not realize until this moment. Yes. And so I, uh, I understand what you're saying. You rarely learn very much if all you do is talk, if you don't ask questions. You don't, you don't learn. And one of the things that I learned from being a focus group moderator is that people in the political milieu develop a way of talking that is disconnected from the way most people talk. I have only been here for about 18, 19 months, but um, my, my colleagues here um, exempted from this. Um, there's a little bit of a talking points machine that develops amongst people in the political class, you know, we, and we all, that's why we all sort of sound the same. And so could you just talk a little bit more about, um, so for, so let me just, let me ask you this question. When I talk about, uh, I come from a Midwestern state, a purple state. When I talk about climate, I try to talk about it in terms of specifics, like, you know, flooded fields and the realities of people's lives. And then I also try to talk about the opportunity that is in, implicit in taking action. Rather than the cost of not taking action, I try to talk about the opportunity there if we do take action. I'd be interested in your advice and thoughts on that. I love that. And the fact that you are a focus group moderator, <laughs> we got to get coffee and experiences. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is great. I'll show you the times when I've been chewed out by my focus groups. Personalize, individualize, and humanize, which is a simple question. I can't see behind me, but I would ask a question. You can tell me how many hands go up, and I can see behind you. How many of you know of someone who either lost a house because of a hurricane, a tornado, a forest fire? How many of you, because of a natural disaster, have no of someone who lost a home, raise your hands. Okay, mm -hmm. I can actually see how many mm -hmm. are up there and how few of you. So you guys need to lose a few more homes so you match <laughs> your constituents back there. That's personalizing it and that's individualizing it. And then you ask the question, if I can give you a solution that will prevent most of that from happening, would you invest in it? It's the rhetorical question that is most powerful. Rather than making a statement, you ask them, what would you be willing to pay 
to get that home back, to get that opportunity back, to get that life back? And the answer for most people is everything. You ask the right question and you personalize it and I promise you, I commit to you, that you'll get the impact you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. Uh, what's the toughest demographic? And we'll start with Mr. Hugh and go down the line. The toughest? Tough, toughest nut to crack in terms of persuading your fellow Republicans. Uh, just when I talk to them? Yeah. I mean, I mean, people. I mean, what category of people is it? Is it people your parents' age, your grandparents' age? Is it yeah? Is it religious conservatives? Is it not? I'm just interested in sort of where where the sweet spot is and where you think Ooh, we have a, we have, we're a couple of years off from being able to get there. Right. Yeah. Um, the toughest nuts to crack are probably the ones. Um, yeah, I, I'd say I, I've had some a lot of Facebook conversations with friends from Missouri, um, or, and if they're probably 40 or up, they really disagree with me on climate change. They think I'm wasting my time caring about this. Um, and the reason is is because they they buy into... They feel like they're being called stupid. Um, whether or not they are or not, they feel like they're being called stupid or they're thought of as stupid by others. And they resent that. And it makes them wall up in really significant ways. And it makes it so that we can't have a meaningful conversation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd say that's it. It's an elite thing. It's like, because the way I've been framing it, especially as we talk to the yeah. labor community, is that even Democrats say the right thing about engaging regular people, working people, union members, union leaders, mm -hmm. but it's sort of three paragraphs down and at the end. Right. And so there's still this sense that climate action is some sort of elite project to be configured by people who live on the coasts and to be imposed on, on the rest of the country. Is that, am I getting that about right? I, I'd say it's a little bit different. I don't think it's seen as an elite project. It's seen as a weapon, right? Ah, it's okay. seen as a... Worse than an elite project. Right, right, worse. <laughs> it's seen as a weapon to say, I care about the planet and you don't, essentially. And it not, I'm not saying that's anybody's, that, that's true. That's just... No, but it's a, like a moral bludgeon. It's a moral bludgeon. Yeah, okay. very much so. Ms. O'Brien. I'm running your focus group for you, Frank. <laughs> I want my job back. <laughs> um, I would say it's not any characteristic of person that you can look at and know them on site. Anyone who's a combative partisan uh, and also anyone who didn't vote for John McCain in 2008 uh, because those are the people who no longer... It's about a zero-sum game for them, generally. It's about winning. It's winning today. Um, and they've forgotten the party that we were as recently as 2008. Mr. Lutz. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that the business community will be watching this because in the end, they actually do have the solutions and we're dependent upon them. So I look to the automotive industry, which has led American innovation, and I am hoping that GM, that Ford, that Chrysler, that they make the commitment to turn all of their cars into E85. And if they all turn into E85 and we can use natural gas, not just oil, we'll be putting a lot less carbon in the air. We'll be a lot less dependent on foreign oil. We can make a difference. To me, the business community who's willing to make an investment in a cleaner air, cleaner water, healthier environment, it is essential. And if they're not willing to do it, then we need to push them. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to strike the balance between the ecological reality, which I think calls for not just urgency, but boldness and scale, not just boldness and scale in the United States, but our leadership being leveraged through, uh, through diplomacy across the planet. Um, but I'm trying to strike the balance in terms of motivating people to not speak in such apocalyptic terms that people shut down. And I think if and when the economy slows, there will be even less of an appetite to kind of uh, devote mind space to something that is not core to one's personal, financial, and family stability. And so I'm just, you know, maybe I'll start with Dr. Luntz. 
trying to strike that right balance because, I first of all, I don't want to engage in happy talk and just say solar's tripling and we have all kinds of opportunities because we do have to talk about the consequences of, of climate change. We do have to talk about the moral challenge in front of us, and I don't want to shy away from that and therefore do half measures. On the other hand, I think if you freak people out, they will freeze in time and just focus on their own personal a financial situation and their own personal safety and shut this kind of a, a, a thing down. So can you give me some guidance on, on, on how you strike that balance? I'll give you the language, and I appreciate the opportunity, although I still admit that I, as much as I wanted you to invite me to Hawaii, I'd much rather have a conversation <laughs> with you about focus groups. That's why I have no private life, and mm -hmm. I'm here right now. <laughs> if we do this right, we get cleaner air. We get less dependence on foreign fuels and enhance national security. We get more innovation in our economy and more jobs and great new careers. And that's if the scientists are wrong. If the scientists are right, we get all of those things and begin to solve what could be the most catastrophic environmental problem that any of us have ever faced. That's a pretty good bet to make because it's a no regrets strategy, and that's what I want you to call it. It doesn't mean it's easy. But it means if we do it and do it right, we get all of those benefits out of this policy approach, and that's why it's the right thing to do. I'm giving them a piece of the negative, I'm wrapping it in the positive, and it's a call to action. I promise you, across the aisle, across the age groups, it works. Ms. O'Brien. Uh, speaking about the issue in terms of risk is what I think is the correct way to go forward on this, um, because everybody has been talking about the most likely outcomes of climate instability um, and what is probable to happen. Uh, but if you're mentioning, yes, there is the chance that there's a lesser impact, but there is also on the flip side, a very high chance of or a very a lower chance of very high impact to our climate um, and then taking a free market approach again. Uh, is a less alarmist way to speak about the issue. Um, because we're not saying you have to sacrifice our entire economy or everything that you know. We're saying, okay, you put a price on carbon upstream at the source with the support of industry and then return the money to the American public in the form of a dividend check, and that starts to feel a little bit less aggressive to people. Sure. Mr. Huey? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. I think also... Um, talking about the excitement of the future and how if we tackle this, we don't even know what technologies are going to be invented yet is a really helpful thing to do. Um, the wonder of the future is a pretty cool thing. You know, there's a lot of things that we couldn't imagine we're going to be, we would be experiencing today that we are thanks to the free market and thanks to, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, thanks to a lot of crises that have forced us to innovate. This is another one of those. Um, the electric vehicle in industry was kind of a joke until... Elon Musk came along and he didn't come and say, listen, you need to do this because it's better for the planet. He said, this vehicle is going to change the way that driving occurs entirely. Right. Um, and, and, and made it so if there's a way that we can turn our, our future from a scary, horrible place into a sexy, super exciting place, um, people are really going to jump for that. Right. It's, uh, Pretty cool what he's been able to do, even if Elon Musk has been bonkers a little bit lately. <laughs> he's still a pretty cool guy. Um, the as other a, thing, as a member of the banking committee, I will not comment on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we need a little bit of crazy sometimes, don't we, Brian? Yes. Right. Uh, well, sorry. And then just one more thing, if I may. Um, I do believe that that is a band aid solution. I think that if we talk about that, that's that's okay. I'm an advertiser, right? I'm all about branding, but. I think it's a Band-Aid solution when kind of what's needed is open heart surgery with, because that's really where the problem lies, right? I really think that the next time a big crisis comes along, we're going to have the exact same problem if we can't figure out how to be radical about working together. Thank you. Uh, one last question before I turn it over to Senator, Senator Smith uh, for a second round. Uh, you know, my instinct is that... Um, is not to talk about whether or not climate change is real anymore. I think it's a fruitless exercise. I think that, I mean, I know the science is settled, and I, I think the politics is mostly settled. I do think there's sort of some room for explaining the difference between climate and weather and explaining the relationship between climate and weather, but that gets pretty boring pretty quick, frankly, for a lot of people. So I'm just sort of interested in, in I, I guess this is specific to Dr. Luntz, whether you think that's even... Like, whether that's just some wormhole we should avoid 
or maybe that's in the, in the course of debating something with a person, that may be worth doing. Uh, but I do think that um, people need to understand the relationship between climate and weather, maybe not explicitly, but at least intuitively. I do think meteorologists play a, a major role and are getting better about this, but your thoughts? Yeah, I watch some of these meteorologists, and I wonder how they got a job. So I'm not convinced. If you travel the Well, country, there are meteorologists, and there are meteorologists, yes. Well, I, then I'm referring to the meteorologists. Yeah, okay. <laughs> not the meteorologists. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I want, I actually, if I were advising you, I'd be talking about clean air and safe water. And while that is not a direct relationship, it is something that people care about immediately. And it's something that no one can dismiss. If you wanted to change the environmental rules in this country, all you do is show a child putting a glass of water underneath the faucet and having it come out, and can they see particles in it, or does it not look right to them? Or the idea that you, not, you should not be seeing the air that you're breathing. And I want to communicate it from a parent to a child because it is what parents are more concerned about than anything else. When you ask parents what matters most for their children is that they grow up healthy. So if we are doing anything that contributes to an unhealthy world, that will connect to them more than getting into the science. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, a lot of us have... One of you um, mentioned uh, kind of outreach and, and connecting up with the business community, and um, this is something that this is something that I've been trying to do because in Minnesota we have businesses that are very strong on um, sustainability. Though I know this, I, I appreciate the challenges of that word, but really trying to figure out how to reduce their carbon footprint, trying to be more energy efficient, and they're really being great leaders in this field. Um, yet. The challenges are that the big, honestly, to be, you know, the big business organizations in this country are really not in, they're, I think they're a little out of step with their members on this issue. And, um, you know, Dr. Luntz, I was just looking at some of your polling. It's very interesting, and it shows what I would believe to be true based on my experience in Minnesota. 80% um, of voters want Congress to put politics aside and reach a bipartisan solution. Mr. Huey, they're right with you on that. 74% um, of registered voters support regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant. I mean, this would suggest that Americans are, are like, strongly aligned with this. Yet, I mean, and I'm trying really hard not to be partisan about this, but yet the leadership of both parties aren't aligned on this. And so part of what our problem is is trying to figure out how to specifically to build bridges with our colleagues who represent, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, who represent the same voters that we do, but yet are so reluctant to kind of come to the table. And um, how, how do you think we should approach this? Um, you've got the name and shame. You've got the shame part of it down but you don't have the name part of it down, uh -huh. which is to have a, first off, it's holding your own side accountable when they use per language, holding your own side accountable when they don't acknowledge they've made mistakes. But I think even more important is to show those who are doing it successfully, to celebrate them. When you look at the front page of the newspaper, it's all the companies that, that the media is trying to shame, and usually for good reason. But there's never the positive. Those companies that have actually reduced their carbon footprint, those companies, and I'm going to surprise you, one of the companies that have done the most in this area is News Corp, owned by Rupert Murdoch. A Democrat saying something nice about Rupert Murdoch in the environment is not going to happen. I invite either of you to praise him right now for his corporate-wide effort and I will just warn you that if you do, be prepared for your social media accounts to be flooded. But that's honestly how you do it. Mm -hmm. Not just shaming, but also naming those who are doing it right. So that's, that's yeah. And, and as I do with, you know, Target and Best Buy and General Mills and the Minnesota companies that are doing it right. And then, you know, trying to, it's, it's trying to figure out doing that and then also establishing the, um, you know, you not only catching people doing something right, but then inviting them in to do 
more right. Yeah. But what would the rest of you say? Mr. Yui. Uh, no, I'd reiterate what he said. I thought that was really, really cool. Um, and then you talk about taking a place at the table. My dad's a marriage and family therapist, and he, uh, sorry, I, I, I uh, and so he, he had a really cool, anal uh, this thing that he taught me, um, that was when two people, when, when two people in a couple are fighting, right, they will both stiffen up. And it's interesting because you, neither of you in that moment want to be vulnerable, right? You want to protect yourself. Your teeth are bared. But at some point, one person will soften, right? And instantly, when that person becomes vulnerable, the other person softens as well. They don't take their swipe even though they could, right? And those marriages, those go on to continue. But there also come marriages where nobody will soften, where no one will loosen up and say, listen, I'm sorry, and in those marriages, it ends in divorce, right? I believe that we're hard right now. I, I really like what you're talking about, about holding your own party accountable. I'm, I'm not saying, I, I get it. I know that Republicans have messed up a lot, right, on the Hill. I, I absolutely acknowledge that. But Democrats have too. Somebody needs to soften. And if you guys care more, then be the first ones to do it, you know? I really think if you're able to do something like that, introducing a resolution to say, hey, sorry about past actions, let's put that behind us on this one thing, would make headlines and speak millions to the American public and to everyone else that's here on the Hill. Um, I think one thing that's important to recognize is the nuance between asking for incrementalism and the, the contrast with not asking for everything all at once. So you're neither saying, like, this is enough, uh, but you're also not saying this is an all or nothing. If you don't, it's my way or the highway. If you don't implement my policy, I want nothing. Or you're doing nothing. Uh, so just holding the ability to recognize the small steps, because especially in Congress today, like there have been important steps that have been taken in the Republican Party on this issue. Um, so praising the little things, um, like Dr. Lentz was saying, um, I think could go a really long way. Thanks. My mother used to say, don't make perfect be the enemy of the good. And uh, I think about that all the time here in Congress. And it's why, you know, I'm um, working on carbon sequestration bills with uh, Senator Hoven and some of my other Republican colleagues, even though some of my Democratic colleagues probably think that that's sort of a little bit of a, you know, they don't, they're not all on board with that. And there are other examples of that. And I think also just to, uh, I'll close and I'm, um, Sheldon, my, I'm sure has some questions, but um, I think that as um, as Brian said, you know, we have to we have to uh, not only talk about the little things, but also the big things. And you know this, obviously, especially Ms. O'Brien, because that's what you're working on with the project at uh, the young the the carbon dividend project. Senator, can I give you an example of where it is working here in Colorado? Uh, Cory Gardner and Michael Bennett. They don't agree on a lot but they actually do. And they are repeatedly proposing legislation where they are each other's co-sponsors. A Democrat and a Republican have spoken when they bring their constituents here. And I, too, got emotional. And I'm not supposed to. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> a pollster is not supposed to get emotional. <laughs> but the idea that the two of them would do so much work together even though they belong to other parties, is truly wonderful. And I'm convinced, by the way, that one of them will be, at some point, President of the United States. I just don't know which one. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chair. Witnesses for um, being here. I appreciate it. I think this is um, an important conversation to have. Um, if you go one room over, there's another bipartisan conversation going on on the economic and environmental benefits of carbon capture. And it is celebrating some of the bipartisan work that has been done to advance carbon capture, 45Q, the Use It Act. And I think our next step in that process is going to be the industrial emissions bill that I've done with Senator Manchin and Senator Capito and Senator Braun and Senator Booker. So, um, there actually is quite a nice thread of progress beginning to emerge. 
Uh, I also spend a lot of time on college campuses. Rhode Island is a real super higher ed state. We've got multiple great universities. And I can promise you that on those universities, there is nobody who is denying climate change or seeking to obstruct progress. I don't care how conservative or Republican you are. In that generation, in that population, people are eager for us to engage and start to work our way through to a solution. I also think that there is a lot of willingness on the Democratic side to accept what has heretofore been the Republican solution. If you look at the Republicans who have fought their way through the climate change problem and recommended a solution, something like 90% of them come to a robust price on carbon that can be adjusted to meet the actual physical, natural demands of solving the problem, and that is border adjustable so the cement plant in Texas doesn't lose out to the cement plant in Mexico and is revenue neutral so we're not trying to sneak in building big government into the solution. And we're there. That's essentially uh, Chairman Schatz's and my bill. So at the end point, I think there's going to be a healthy and robust discussion about where revenue should be used. But I think the fundamental tenets of a successful legislative solution to this problem exist and are bipartisan. So why aren't we there? To me, the why aren't we there boils down to a couple of groups that are really going out of their way to try to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, and I'll mention three. One is Americans for Prosperity, one is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and the third is the National Association of Manufacturers. I'll set Americans for Prosperity aside because my opinion is that that is not a real group. It is a confection created by the Koch brothers, staffed with their money to look like a trade association, but it's fundamentally their phony baloney operation. But NAM has always been pretty real, and they're pretty significant. They were just identified as the worst climate obstructor in Congress by influence map. So what's up with that? Because if you look at their membership, they're not really there. So that's an interesting question, and it signals to me that NAM could move and doesn't have to be the worst climate obstructor in Congress. Right behind them, statistically tied for worst, is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which actually is slightly worse than the National Association of Manufacturers because they don't just lobby, they actually electioneer. They ran anti-climate ads against a candidate in Pennsylvania, for instance. So they even electioneer on anti-climate stuff. But again, look at their corporate members. You do not see the same kind of climate denial and obstruction that the U.S. Chamber manifests among most of their corporate membership. My take on this is that they are secretly funded by the fossil fuel industry, and that's why they're behaving the way they are, because the way they're behaving doesn't align with their membership. So th I think this is another positive sign that if and when pressure comes to have those two entities, primarily the chamber, but also National Association of Manufacturers, reverse their position and go from brakes on, not interested, horn blaring to silence the noise, to, okay, let's get this thing in gear and let's get moving. That will make a really epic shift and we'll be able to take advantage of the power that you guys represent here, of the message that Dr. Luntz uh, represents here, and expand what's happening next door into a full-on discussion about a real solution to this problem, which, by the way, also puts America back into the position of world leadership that is a city on a hill we are supposed to exhibit. So I am really optimistic, and I just said all that because I want to encourage you to keep saying what you're saying and keep doing what you're doing, because hearing it from inside the Republican Party makes such a big difference. We can get tuned out. ICCP has been tuned out. Sierra Club gets tuned out. People hearing it from their home state university, people hearing it from inside the party, those things really matter. So we've got to keep pushing those. And I, I just want to thank uh, the chairman for this hearing and let you all know that I feel that we are quite close. Um, if you read Henry V, once more unto the breach. If we have to fill it up with our dead, that was the wall at Harfleur during the siege. There's a place where you breach the wall and the battle goes. The siege succeeded at Harfleur. 
in history. And the breach right now, I think, is the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers changing their actual political stance on this so they are supporting a solution rather than opposing a solution. And when you look at their membership and when you look at the politics of this, I think they're close. And when that day comes, the gate opens, and we're back to where we were before Citizens United, which is in 2007, 2008, 2009, we had five serious bipartisan bills being worked on in the Senate. That all stopped when this machinery kicked up. But we have in recent memory a history of bipartisan work that can come right back as soon as the machinery changes its focus. Can I ask, if I may, can I ask a question? Sure. The questions are supposed to go the other way, but I'm delighted. Fire away. It's actually for them. Raise your hands if you've read Henry V. Wow. Uh, it's okay. Raise your hands if you're telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Henry V. <laughs> Senator Bennett. Who was introduced oh, as one of the two same, possible next presidents same, of the United same, States by same, Frank Luntz. I'm not same, sure how much that helps your Thank Christmas bid. Day. Uh, uh, I got something I want to say, and then I want to ask Frank a question. Um, what I want to say is how grateful I am, uh, Mr. Chairman, for you, you holding this hearing. It literally almost brings a tear to my It does bring a tear to my eye because... I think we cannot accept the broken political system that we have in Washington. We cannot allow it to define our approach to the future, and we never do this. Nobody ever makes an attempt to do this. We come in and we read the talking points every week. We don't fix any problems. We blame the other side. We raise some money. We get reelected. This is an attempt to actually try to break that Gordian knot, and I want to thank you for it. I, I think it is incredibly uh, it is, it is incredibly important. Um, and, and it's important because I keep hearing on the campaign trail that we need to act urgently on climate change. And the young people I meet with in particular say that. Um, and it's true. We have, to act, we have to act urgently on climate change. And at the same time we do that, we have to create a durable solution. If you accept a world where we put stuff in for two years and then the, the Republicans tear it out, or accept a world where we have a president who gets elected for a term and puts some stuff in, and then we accept that it will all get ripped out again when they're done, we're never going to solve climate change. We will have to confess to the world that in this self-governing republic of ours, we can't come up with an answer on climate because we've accepted the broken politics that we have it's about putting stuff in for two years and ripping it out two years later, which is as important as acting urgently. In my mind, we have to do both things. We have to act urgently, and this is the work of our lifetimes. And, 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 it, and we can't do it in the current political, with accepting the current political decision-making that goes on around here. We just simply can't, and we have to admit it. And having a hearing like that, this is... I think a very important step forward to being able to, 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 to do it, because it's not just about bludgeoning people, it's about trying to do something. I want to ask you, Frank, I read your testimony, I saw your slides. My state is a third Democratic, a third Republican, and a third Independent. A majority of Republicans in my state believe climate change is real, humans are contributing to it, and we need to do something about it. The polling in the country says that Climate change is real, and we need to do something about it. We have a climate ch change denier in the White House who won his election proudly declaring that he denied the climate change is real and making a case, I guess, that dealing with climate would destroy the economy in ways that would... I would like you to tell us, to sort of summarize, because in my view, it should be disqualifying to, run, to be a president if you are a climate denier. I don't mean that in a moral sense, although I believe that in a moral sense. I do believe that. I mean that in a political sense. You, it should be politically disqualifying to get elected if you're asserting that climate change is real. And it, he didn't do it. He did it every day. How did we lose to this guy? Uh, now, you know that I suggested that either you or Cory Gardner would become president, so you need to be nice to me. 
Well, I, I appreciate your saying that. I, yeah, I will be. I don't know which one. <laughs> and can I also suggest that that is an outstanding line that I would expect to hear from you next Wednesday in Detroit because there will be, instead of 18 people behind me, there'll be 18 million people watching you. And that is a very good way to say it. And you also notice that the president's position on climate has changed over the last couple of years. Have you listened to what he's been saying in the last few months? My answer to you is that it goes back to the basic principles of what matters most. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave 2016 alone how do you make it matter to people right now? How do you personalize, humanize, and individualize it so people see their own role in it, so they're not intimidated by it, so they see they can make a difference? You've got a coastal state. It should be easier for you. I'm watching Republicans in Florida change their tune because of what's happening to Miami. And we know what's happening in New Orleans. We saw what happened. Part of my testimony is I watched it myself when I opened up my curtains and I saw the fire, I saw the flames from my bedroom, and I had to wonder over the next five hours, would my house still exist? That's how you do it, Senator. You challenge on a personal human level. It is not about the science. It is not about the theory. It is not about ideology. It's about us. And it's easy for you because your state will be affected more than anybody else if we don't get it right. That's how you communicate it. And you do so by pulling people in, by asking what matters to you. Every time a senator or a member of Congress ask a question of their constituents and let their constituents speak, you're moving the ball forward. How often did your candidate in 2016 invite people to speak? She didn't. She told them. And she had a lot to say, but she told them. I'm offering you the secret to your success going forward, which is asking rather than telling. That's my answer, Senator. Thanks. Senator Heinrich. I actually came to listen. I know that's a shocking <laughs> development from someone in my position, but um, I'm going to pass. Thanks. This is a historic moment. I, I'm for Senator Heinrich. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I really want to thank the testifiers. I want to thank uh, everybody who's uh, watching in person and watching online. I want to thank everybody's staff. Uh, this has been an extraordinary uh, hearing. It's been uh, entertaining. It's been uh, enlightening. It's been fun. Uh, and let this be the beginning of a longer conversation because we've been, we've been uh, getting to know each other even though it's across the dais. But part of what uh, Nick has been talking about in particular is a lack of trust. And uh, in order to get there, we're going to have to all move up this hill together. And that is not purely a matter of communication strategy. That's a matter of building the coalition necessary yeah. to, to achieve a durable solution. So that means that this can't be the only hour and a half uh, during which we interact. We're going to have to let this be the beginning of a longer uh, and building conversation. So thank you very much.